God, we thank You for blessing us with this day and the luxury that we have of being able to meet here um, unthreatened and um, unencumbered by our, our government and um, the environment around us. And we know lots of our brothers and sisters around the world are not so blessed. We pray that uh, your Holy Spirit will move in on us in this next uh, several minutes that we're going to be talking about your work here at West Houston. Bless us so that everything that we think and say is focused on advancing your kingdom among the people that we know and that we come in contact with. And dedicate us to that, uh, to that good outcome. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thanks for coming. I bet you got an email from Debbie Potter inviting you to this. And uh, I'll, I'll start with the, with the end in mind. What we want to arrange is a conversation or discussion one-on-one -on -one between you, or actually it's two-on-one, -on -one, with a couple of elders. And we want to do that over the next several weeks. So two elders want to meet with you as an individual, or you as a couple, or you as a family. However, that you know, applies to your particular situation. And that's the outcome that we're working toward. And the session today is to just really lay the groundwork for that, give you an idea of how we got to where we are, and then some of the details about how we're going to accomplish these meetings uh, with, with you and with the elders. That's what this whole game is today, okay? The reason that we're recording this in video and audio is that there's a lot of people that weren't able to come to a session like this today. And so we're gonna make this available on the web so that people can have this kind of orientation. So when we get that one-on-one -on -one meeting, um, you know, they don't have that deer in the headlights look. They've gotten this orientation, you know, just like you have. Understand what's the game plan, how does this fit in the world, and you know, all those kinds of things. So that's, that's what we're really up to. So we're on a journey together as the West Houston family, and we have been for a long time. And so I want to uh, record recent history and get us up to now. And then Scott's gonna talk about what uh, the soon to be, the, the sun, soon to be future is gonna look like with us uh, together. So, you know, we started and uh, if you were here before we moved into this building, we were down the road and we were playing what I call logistical whack-a-mole. And uh, we ran out of classroom space and so that little guy would pop up and we'd hit him on the head by creating more classroom space. And then we didn't have enough uh, auditorium room for worship and we'd put more seats in and then we'd run out of parking lot space, so we'd tear out some lawn and put in more parking spaces. We were doing things like that till we finally ran out of room and we were hitting the boundary fences. So then we moved here and we solved all those problems. We didn't have those logistical problems anymore. And when we came here, we established a mission of seeking God, serving others, and sharing Jesus. That was a good mission, it still is. So if you think about seeking God, and I don't know about you, but I kind of take some of these things for granted. We do a good job in seeking God, especially in our adult curriculum. And it's obvious to me when we have guests come in or guest speakers come in and they look at our curriculum and are just you know, blown away about how over the top it really is compared to other curriculums they've seen and approaches they've seen in other places. We have uh, LTC, we have a youth ministry, we have a children's ministry. That, that really do a, a, a lot toward fulfilling that seeking God mission. In serving others, we've just got a market basket full of serving other ministries and initiatives that are going on. And Emory Elementary is one that, you know, is on our radar screen a lot, but we've got Arms of Hope, Hands of Hope, Recovery, uh, Divorce Care, uh, saving your marriage before it starts. You know, a whole host of family-related things that we're doing. Impact, uh, all kinds of things involving uh, impact. And of course, we got some relief things going on in some of our mission points like India, Guatemala, Mexico, those kinds of things. When you think about sharing Jesus, the sharing Jesus kind of gets short shrift, if you will, compared to the other two. 
if you really had to equate all three of them, it's kind of the lesser of the three. We do some sharing Jesus. We do celebrate Jesus, which is really obvious and wonderful, but it's, you know, almost a point in time impact. It's just one weekend that we really do that. It impacts a lot of people. It's really positive, but it's pretty time focused. And then we have other things that we do like Emory Elementary, impact, our missions work that kind of open the window for sharing Jesus. But you know, they're not overtly evangelistic in, in their own right. And so if you had to look at it, we're a little bit off balance to the detriment of the sharing Jesus part. And we want to take account of that and not be naive about that. Um, a little less than five years ago, you know, we had Faith Challenge 2013. And Faith Challenge 2013 took the mission statement and tried to create some practical, actionable things to make our mission statement real. And so we said some things in Faith Challenge 2013, which by the way is you know, gonna be mature next year. Uh, we said things like, we want to put some education together around seeker or the less spiritually mature person that might be coming here for the first time. We said, what about uh, Spanish service, Spanish class, maybe even a Spanish minister? And you know, we've, we've got that. Our Spanish minister is gonna join us just in a few weeks. So we've accomplished a number of things about that Faith Challenge 2013. And then earlier this year, the oversight elders were involved in a study about our cultural environment that we are in. How is the culture around us moving at a faster pace than we're moving? And you know, if you keep that kind of trajectory up, long enough, you're gonna be irrelevant, right? There's no sticky between you and the environment that you're in. So there's some core truths that you must continue to preserve, and you have to be cognizant of how relevant you are, where you are. And so we had, we had some of those kind of things. One is, we need spiritual leadership, and we need to be bringing up leaders at West Houston from an earlier generation than the leaders that we have now. So that when it comes time, they're gonna be ready. We said that there are some core beliefs and some allegiances that people hold really dear that we need to be aware of. Uh, we said that there are um, ethnic and racial and cultural things going on in that the community around us is browner, blacker, yellower, than has been before and than we are now. And so we need to embrace everyone that needs Jesus regardless of what their color is. But the byproduct of that is we're gonna be browner and blacker and yellower. And we ought to be thrilled about that. We ought to be engaging that, inviting that. That's part of our reality of being relevant. And then we ought to use technology. We must use technology more and better than we do because the upcoming generations are more connected, they're faster, and uh, it just provides opportunity that we're not tapping. And so that, that brings us to now, and it makes me think about the servants in Matthew chapter 25, you know, and the master came and said, I'm gonna give you some talents, and I'm gonna leave, and I'm gonna entrust these to you. And here at West Houston, we're the five talent man. We're the, we're the guy that the master came to and said, you've got more than your peers have. And you think about the blessings that surround us and the investment God has made in us in a lot of different ways. Well, you know, in Matthew 25, when the master left, those three servants had to take stock and decide what they were gonna do. And that's the position that we're in now. We have to decide. So what's next? If, if we take the changes that are around us, the fundamentals of our core beliefs, and these blessings that God has entrusted to us, what's next? So how do we determine what's next? Well, there's, there's two or three key ways to do that. One is to pray. And we wanna engage you in prayer, and we want you praying for us as elders. We want you praying for you as an individual, as a family. We want you praying for West Houston as a family. 
that we're going to be empowered and enabled and encouraged to take up our talents and put them to work for God the way that we should. We're going to engage in careful consideration and part of that careful consideration is the shepherd is going to reach out and talk to the sheep and listen to the sheep and that's this exercise that we're talking about today. And then we want to listen for God's guidance. We want you to do that as well because we don't know how God's going to reveal himself to us but we're certainly going to be asking and we're going to be listening. And so we want you to be attuned to that, part of that, praying for that. And so the what's, what's next part is, uh, is what Scott's going to take us through and transition from recent history to the very next short steps that we're going to take. And so uh, my job is to, uh, just to want to make sure people are clear on this, we don't have the, the future in our heads now. The process is that we're going to talk about how we get to what that is. So uh, that's where I'm going to spend my time. To do that, I want to talk about some definitions, some terminology, and get a shared understanding of what the, the terms mean. So that as we kind of talk forward, we'll, we'll kind of be talking from the same set of understanding. So uh, let me just use a visual aid here. If at any time you can't hear what I say, please just kind of give me a signal and say, I can't hear you, and I'll, I'll try to help you with that. So let's just write a few words down here. I'm going to play on what Ken has said in this conversation coming up next. Let's start with the word at the bottom here, mission. Uh, Ken alluded to this. All right, so this is us getting together on what we mean when we say, what is our mission? So we want to talk about that in just a minute. But just to help us with this, let's just say that the mission answers the question, why are we here? What do we do? What are we supposed to do? Why are we here? Why do we even exist? And so Ken's just brought you through a few things that he talked about but we take our cues from really from the New Testament in terms of why are we here. And so it's simple things that are really clear and crisp in your minds. Matthew chapter 28, what were Jesus' words toward the end of his time here on earth? Go therefore into all nations, baptizing them, right? That's got to be part of our mission. That's not us making up our own mission. That is the mission. In Matthew chapter 22, when they asked what was the greatest of the commands, uh, commandments, Jesus said the greatest was... Love God with all your heart and soul and mind. And the second one was like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so we feel like that's definitely part of our mission. And so you get stuff like serve others. Uh, in Matthew chapter 25, there's the parable of the sheep and the goats. And he's telling the story about uh, these people that he said, depart from me. Why do they depart? Because when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was in prison, you didn't visit. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me drink. You, didn't, you never came to see me when I was ill, etc. If you didn't do this to the least of me, you're not doing it to me. This, and likewise, those who did, he said, come, come be with me. That's got to be a part of our mission statement. It's what we do. And so when we think about those kinds of things, we get to a place where we say, we know what we need to be doing. James captures it in chapter 1. Pure religion is taking care of widows and orphans and keeping ourselves unpolluted by the world. This is, uh, this is what we're about. This is why we're here. And so these six words that Ken used a minute ago are not our mission, and it's not our, we didn't invent this. This is just a paraphrase of the things that Scripture tells us to do. Seek God, and those passages just kind of summarize those. Serve others, and share Jesus. In fact, that's not just West Houston's mission. In other words, it's the same mission for everybody that would follow Christ. That ought to be their mission. If that's not the mission, something's wrong. Something's wrong with that. And so this is the way that we've decided to capture it, and we decided to make it a slogan for us so that we don't lose focus on that. And that is just, that's great. Why? Because that's just Scripture paraphrased, basically. So we think of this mission statement as being something that's unchanging. So if Jesus doesn't return again in the next 200 years and there's a West Houston Church of Christ in 150, and you go to that in that time and you say, what's your mission? They ought to have a mission that's something like this. Maybe these exact words, 
may be something slightly different, but it will be about seeking God, loving God, serving others, and sharing Jesus. That's not going to change. We're not going to change that because, it, frankly, we didn't make it up. It was given to us. That's the mission. So let's go to another word here. I'm going to introduce one here. And Ken alluded to this as well. Talents. And let's just describe this in the Matthew 25 sense. There were three stewards. One was given one talent, one was given two, one was given five. All right. So what does it mean when we say talents? So let's say this answers the question, how are we equipped? And each time I say we, I'm talking about West Houston here, right? West Houston. Now we already agreed, I think we agreed, I saw a lot of shaking heads, that this is not just our mission. It should be every follower of Christ ought to have a mission like this that fits into this. The talents now is kind of unique to West Houston. What do we mean when we say, what do you have in terms of talents? Well, that means several things, but in one it means talent. What do we have in terms of our people and skills and, and, and abilities and resources and influence? Those are things that we possess in our body here because our members have these things. We have talent here. We have people that can do things for people around us, that know how to make things happen, that know how to worship, that pray, that, that, do, that are strong in faith. We have talents here, lots of talents. And that's in the talent sense, kind of like in the Webster's Dictionary sense. All right? We have resources. We are sitting on a campus today that's worth some $14 million or something, and it's debt-free. We have uh, people, 900 to 1,000 people to come to church every Sunday that have a lot of income. We have really no real constraints, at least not to what we've done so far, around resources. That's just not what we have. That's something that we've been blessed with here, and it's one of the things that lines up under what we would call talents for us. We have that here. We also have some other things, though. We have access. So if we're going to carry this mission out, and we look around, if you went in five miles in any direction and drew a circle around you that was five miles radius, you'd have hundreds of thousands of people who need Jesus. Right here. Walk out this door in any direction, one mile, and you'll walk past the houses of a bunch of people who need Jesus right now. Any direction, you pick it. That's just the way it's going to be. We have that here. When Jesus said, look, the field is white to harvest, he's talking to us today. Look right around you. Spin around, open your eyes, there it is. It's right in front of you. That's where we are. We have that today. And we also have desire. I can tell you that the elders have a desire to have a greater impact in the kingdom than we've had thus far. I don't want to put down what we've done. We've done great things because of uh, God's will acting out in us, but there's more to achieve. The elders feel it. The ministry staff feels it. You feel it because you come talk to us and tell us about it. We know the desires out there to have a greater impact. And so we call that kind of one of the talents we have also, desire. So we have skills and abilities. We've got resources. We have access. We've got desire. This is what we mean when we say we are, we think, a five-talent church. We've been handed five talents. These things, however, are not unchanging. These things evolve. People move. Economies shift. Demographics change. Fortunes move around. Things just differ. Individuals come into the body. Individuals leave. And so we probably will always have some version of this, but it won't be the same version necessarily. And in some cases, it'll be in more abundance than others. But this is the talents that we use all right, to do this mission. All right. I'm going to save vision for just a minute because that's really the reason that we're here this morning. Let's talk about environment. What do we mean when we envir environment? We say, well, this answers the question, uh, what internal and external factors must we address? We know this mission is true. We know that we've been given talents, but in what environment are we working in? What is around us? What are the people like? And so, just so you know, a couple years ago, uh, those who were serving in the overseer role at the time, this has predated me, 
said, you know what, we've got, we're called to a mission here. We need to be very sensitive to the environment in which we're working. Let's, let's do, spend some time reflecting, let's pray, let's do some research, let's listen to the workings of the Holy Spirit, and let's understand what environment we're in. And they spent months doing this, and they did time away and time together and reflected and so forth, and they came back over months with probably hundreds of things that they said, these are trends that are going on that we need to just be alive to. Jesus knew exactly when he went and talked to people what he was walking into. When he started with his uh, miracle at the wedding at Cana, he knew where he was. When he had the conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well, he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing when he went where he was going and, and when he did what he did. It was part of his environment and he knew it. And so his ministry was shaped by that. We did that kind of work, the elders did at the time. And they came out with a bunch of factors and they said, if we kind of group these around, it looks like they kind of broadly, broadly fall into six buckets. And so those buckets were these things. Uh, one was, we are in a world of what I'll call, this is a kind of a fancy word, pluralism. We're in a world where people don't necessarily want to think there is a truth. Everything's good. Just be open-minded. There's no truth, right or wrong. It's kind of so forth. Well, actually, uh, we believe there is eternal truth, right? And that the world needs to know what it is, and it centers on Christ. And so that doesn't mean everything's truth. That doesn't mean that I can't grow by understanding there's different points of view. Of course, I can grow that way. But uh, there's one Jesus, and we need to be clear around what those things are. And so pluralism is one of those things, which means we need to be clear on what our core beliefs are, right? And it doesn't matter what age you're in, there ought to be core beliefs. What are those things? Pluralism. Tied to that because it often comes in the form of this. I think I'm spelling this right, but I don't, don't uh, hold me to that. Millennials. What's a millennial? Millennial is somebody that today is in their 20s probably, maybe early 30s. Kind of came to age in the new millennium is where that term came from. So they're that in their age group. And they have a feeling, they have a different way often about looking at life. And it's not because they're bad people or they belong to a particular group. You get to be in the millennials by being born in 1990, give or take a few years. That's how you become a millennial, right? And you're shaped by the way the world works and interacts and so forth. And so we are living and walking amongst a generation of millennials. That's the way it is. Many of us have children that are millennials, right? So we just needed to know that. That means certain things. That also led to the fact that this group, and in fact we all and the ones behind them, need to understand what good leadership looks like and understand how to be a good leader. Each one of us has a time where we need to lead well and a time when we need to follow well and you have them going all the time. You're doing this, you need to be a good follower. Occasionally you'll need to lead, right? When you do, you need to be good at it. When you follow, you need to be a good follower. And so one of the things that we learned is that the generation that comes up needs to know what spiritual leadership looks like and they need to be trained and groomed in that kind of thing. And so without it, there's going to be a lot of trouble. And with it, we have uh, hope to make this what we want it to be. So that was one of the trends that came out of the buck major buckets of thoughts there. Continuing on, another group was technology is going to continue to evolve, evolve and improve and get greater and become more ubiquitous. And so if you've got teens right now, you'll know that if they planned to have a get-together with friends two months in advance, they will know where and when that get-together is going to happen while they're driving to wherever it is. Follow me? And they'll do that by texting on their phone. So even though they've known for two months they're going to have a party for so-and-so's birthday, they won't know where it is and exactly what time it is until they're driving and they're all doing this kind of thing, right? And you say, and I say to my 19-year-old son, son, just call the person and have a conversation. No, why not? You just don't do that, Dad. Why? You just text. Would it have killed your son to know a week ago? that you're, I mean, it's not like you didn't know this was going to happen. No, we got it. We got it. That's just the way it works. That's just one symptom of the way technology pervades what people do. And so, well, what else does that mean? Does that mean we need to be on the bleeding edge of technology in the way we do church? Does that mean we need to have a laser show during the worship? No, certainly not necessarily. I would be against a period, but it may, maybe it would be something. But we need to know that to connect with people, we must use technology. It'd be like saying, I want to go reach those people, but I'm not going to speak to them verbally. 
Well, you know, in today's language, you, you need to figure out what the language is, and you, need, you use that language to reach out. Things have changed, and we need to kind of know that. The growth of the non-Anglo population and its influence is something that's right around us. Ken talked about that. We, our church is getting more diverse with time, but it doesn't reflect what's right around us. So we need to kind of embrace that, figure out why is that not kind of changing as quickly as it could and should, and kind of make that happen. And that's going to continue to grow. And for us to be really vibrant, we're going to end up looking more like our community, exactly like our community, not less. And we're not going to remain in the status quo. So that's another thing that we need to know that's going on in terms of trends. And the last one is declining loyalty to church traditions. And when I talk about church traditions, I'm talking about our tradition, the churches of Christ. That is a tradition. If you ask me, that's a good tradition. There's a reason that we came to the tradition it is, but it's a church tradition. It's not one that the, uh, that the, that the world at large thinks ought to be, kind of be held in such high esteem. Did you know today, if you go to Abilene Christian University and you find out who's going, leaving campus on Sunday morning and going to church, a big percentage of them are not going to Church of Christ. Did you know that? Abilene Christian University. You know, 30 years ago, you thought that would have been a heresy that happened. They're not loyal to the churches of Christ. Fortunately, many of them are loyal to Christ. That's a good thing. That's a great thing. But the fact that they don't go to Church of Christ, that's kind of reality. Now, there can be a whole lot of reasons that I won't get into for why that might be, but we just need to know this is a trend that's going on in our world. It's an environmental factor that we must address. And so when we talk about environment, we're talking about what internal and external factors we must address, and we know that there are many of them, and that these two evolve with time and circumstance. They just change. So that's what they are. And you'd have a group, and if you looked at this, you'd have another, uh, right now, you're thinking of three or four things that aren't, you don't think are bucketed in here. You'd be right, I'm sure about that. We had hundreds, and we categorized them. These are the ones that we said. Uh, mainly those things that say uh, where our status quo do not seem to be quite sensitive to. All right, the last thing I want to talk about is this one is vision, but I want to finish the diagram here because we kind of believe that uh, you build on a mission which is true and scripture-led. You use talents that you have that are evolved and are kind of unique to your body, and you drive it to a vision, and you all do that in an environment that also evolves and is often unique to where you are. The vision, what does that mean? Let's say that that answers the question, what will it, I'm going to underline that, look like in the future. And when I say it, I mean the mission. Uh, and so, and let me say also, this is at West Houston. So what will this mission look like at West Houston in the future? And just for the sake of this conversation, let's just call it 10 years, because 10 years is a long way off, but not so long off that we won't be around to influence it greatly. So let's just use the 10-year time horizon. So this mission is not going to change 200 years from now. This should be the mission. This is likely to change a lot over 10 years, uh, 20 years, 30 years. But right now we've got what we've got, and we kind of have a pretty good handle on what that is, and we are rich with talents in terms of Matthew 25. We've got a pretty good sense of what our environment is. It's characterized in some form there. And so what should our vision look like? So some of you know that I'm a management consultant by trade what I do, which means I and my colleagues help usually big corporations figure out how to do what they do better. That's what, we're, that's what we do. And so there was something that was popular about 20 years ago, and uh, Adam, you might be a little too young to remember this, but uh, there was this thing that vision statements kind of came out. And a vision statement was a compound sentence that had about 30 words or less, and it said, our vision is to become the world's leading provider of blah, whatever it is to the such and so markets and will be number one or number two in the markets we serve. You ever heard that, Zondra? All right, and then you could take that vision statement and you could take it right across the street to your competitor and take your name out and stick their name in and voila, you have a vision statement for that company too. All right, as you can tell, I'm making fun of that because often that really wasn't very useful 
doesn't help you. Now, there were some companies that could come up with one statement that actually was a drastic departure from where they were, and it was useful because it gave them a different compass. It gave them a different direction to go after. All right, so I just want to illustrate that because I want you to have this in your head. Many would say, you know, if the elders are talking about a vision, then that means they're going to come out with a vision statement, a one-sentence, 30-word compound sentence thing, and I'm just saying, no, that's not what we're talking about here. We do not want to come up in four or five months with a vision statement that's one 30-word compound sentence. Instead, what we want to do is write a short story. A short story that describes where we think we're going in 10 years and paints a vision. And it answers questions like this. We go forward 10 years and you come to church at West Houston. You drive up to this campus. What do you see? Do you see these very buildings that you see right today? Do you see another building? A big, bigger building? Do you see 8,000 people coming to church here? Or do you see 1,000 people coming to church here? Do you actually, on um, church 10 years from now, do you actually don't drive to this campus? You drive to another location that we might call a satellite that actually has the sermon beamed through technology from this building to there. That's where the sermon comes from. And the rest of the worship happens locally in a satellite location. It might be in a church building or a strip mall or something else like that. Is that what happens in 10 years? Or do you drive to church at someone's house? You're part of the West Houston Church of Christ that meets at Evelyn's house. And you've got 40 people that meet there on a Sunday morning and they take communion together and they do whatever it is they do there. That could be a vision for West Houston. How do you engage the, the community? Do you see them on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night? Or, or and, do you see them on Monday night and Tuesday night and Thursday night because you've got addiction recovery? Maybe you have a home for unwed mothers. Maybe you have a soup kitchen that operates on Saturday morning. W what is it that you do? Right? When you think about where we spend our money in 10 years, if you were to know that, and by the way, you're all privileged to know that, where we spend our money, is it half of it going to other countries where we're teaching Jesus? Or is 100% of it going to this community to teach Jesus? When you start answering questions like that, you start to paint a vision, and you can't do that in one sentence that's 30 words. Right? When you think about how are you known, do you say, well, we're known by the brotherhood this way? Or you actually say, actually, we don't care how we're known by the brotherhood. We want to know how we're known by the neighborhood. And so we're famous to the neighborhood because they say, that's the church that does this and that and that. When you start answering these questions, and right now we do not know the answers to those questions. That's why we're doing what we're doing now. When you start answering those questions, you start to write a a short story and you paint a picture that basically becomes a day in the life at West Houston. Right? It's several pages and it answers those questions that I've just laid out. What we want to do as an eldership is write that short story. Right? Now why do you even need a vision as you can imagine, by the way, let's just complete this by saying this. This too evolves over time. Every couple years, every five years, every six years, it kind of depends. And the reason it does is because that vision answers the question, what will it be like to do this mission with these talents in that environment? And if this is changing and that's changing, then that's going to change, right? This won't. Everything else does. Why do you need a vision? So if you're trying to lead as an, as, a, as an elder, as we are trying to do this, and we have people, sincere seekers of God's will, coming to us every week, which they do, and say, you know what, Scott, we need to do this. You know what, Ken, we need to invest in that. You know what, James Ford, we need to create a ministry for that. That comes up all the time. If we have no idea where we're going, we're likely to say, sounds good, or actually, first come first serve whatever comes up and we've got room for we take and once we run out you're just out that's one way to do it you know there's a scripture in the bible in proverbs that says where there's no vision the people perish it's my favorite translation there's other translations of that uh, 
And I believe that. I believe that with individuals and organizations. If you don't have a clear picture in your head where you're going as an organization, you're going to end up somewhere and it won't be where you planned when you start and probably will be less than you wish it was. And when it comes to church leadership, if you don't feel like you've heard God's calling and you don't have that vision built in the Holy Spirit, you're going to end up in some place that has less impact for the kingdom than it should. And so when you think of yourself as a five talent steward, you're going to be returning back two or three. We don't want to be in that business. We're not the smartest Bible scholars in the world, but we know one thing, getting handed five talents and returning two was not good, right? Getting handed one and returning one was terrible, we learned in that particular parable. And so we don't want to, we don't want to do that. Being handed five and returning five more, that's what we want to do and that's the, what we think we're called to do. So when you have a vision in your mind, then you start saying, okay, we've got a new ministry idea, and we say, you know what? God is calling us. We spend a lot of time listening to him. God's calling us to this, and that doesn't fit with what we're doing. And so part of the things that you ask your leaders to do at eldership is to make hard choices around things, and we want to be able to do that. To do that, we need to know where we're going. The second thing is, how do you know what vision you have? And this is the last bit that I want to talk about before turning back over to Ken. How do you know what vision you have? Well, we think God will reveal this to us. We spend a lot of time praying about this, talking about this. We're listening for the Spirit to, to speak to us in ways that He will do. Uh, we've reflected, we've discussed it, and, and, and I can tell you a couple things. We feel confident He's going to share with us what it is. One, secondly, today we do not know what it is. We do not have an agenda. We don't have something we're wanting to do that, you know, we just need to kind of get everybody on board so we can go do it. Trust me, you should be at the last, you said 28 uh, elders meetings, you should be at the last several. We are not clear on where we're going. We, we say that. I mean, that's not a confession. That's not a wrong thing. That's just where we are. And we want to get to a place that we know where that is. So how do you do that? How does God speak to you anyway? Well, in Exodus, he spoke to Moses from a burning bush. Uh, in Numbers 22, he spoke to Balaam through the mouth of a donkey. And so we know there's a lot of ways that God can speak to us today, but one of his favorite ways in the Bible was speaking to his people through other people. And so not just prophets, by the way, many others. And so one of the things that we said what we need to do is listen to our brothers and sisters talk to us, and that's going to help us, and we're going to listen to God by listening to them. And so that leads us all to where we are today, which is we intend to write this short story that starts to paint a picture of what God is calling us to be. And we're going to do that by listening to what he tells us. And one major piece of that process is listening to you. We have uh, 900 plus people that come to church here every day. We'd be happy to talk to 900. We thought about saying, let's just invite whoever wants to talk to us to come talk to us. We could have done that. If we'd done that, we probably would have gotten about 20 or 30 conversations, which would have been useful. But what might be better, we thought, was let's push it and let's try to talk to 150 people. Now, for sake of speed, we didn't decide we were going to just talk to all 900 till we got through. But we said, if you look at our whole body and let's just look at picking kind of representative sample folks, I'd like to tell you you're special, but actually you're not much special than anybody else. You just look like in total like the rest of the congregation. And so we wanted to talk to a broad array of folks, young, old, new been here forever. We're talking to people who've left, by the way. You should know that. We're talking to a lot of folks because we want to listen to what God has to tell us about what we should become. And so that's the reason for bringing you here today. Ken is going to tell you now about how we want to move the next few weeks to get this moving. We want to be able to schedule meetings with you, with a um, couple of elders. And there are sign-up sheets on the table as you leave that you can sign up for. And uh, those start as early as tomorrow night, I think, is our first uh, set of sessions. And um, we, don't, we don't have a constrained timetable. Uh, we hope to complete this in January or February, ideally. Uh, but, you know, it, it could take longer than that. It, it might be done sooner. Uh, so we're, we, we don't have an artificial constraint. Um, so ideally on your way out you can write your name down in a space and one of the elders will contact you on getting together. Uh, typically uh, for expedience sake 
A lot of those conversations are going to go on here at this building because we'll have a couple of elders in place that can do a couple of those discussion sessions back to back. Um, you know, they're not all constrained to be that way. Uh, but anyway, that, if, if you'll find a time and uh, a, a date and a time that's um, convenient for you, then an elder will be in touch with you to arrange the, the place for that. We have some uh, questions that we have um, drafted and these are not the only questions, um, but these, these are feedstock material. I like to call them feedstock material on the discussion that we're, we're gonna start with. Now, when you start your discussion with your elder, you may say, nice try on, on those questions, but I wanna go this way. And that's, that's fair game. But you know, this gets us all facing in the same direction to start with. And so we wanted to prompt your thinking so that you can be thinking about these, praying about these, and uh, you might wanna jot some notes down before the meeting. And um, you know, I've, I've done a couple of these already and somebody said, well, I jotted my answers down, I'll give you those, but here's what I really wanna talk about. And so, you know, that's, that's fine. We're really talking about engagement. Um, so we're gonna collect up all those results Kevin is gonna compile those. We're going to look for distinct themes among those. You know, when we get one or 200 pieces of feedback, uh, those in detail are kind of interesting, but what's really vital are the major themes that are distil distilled out of all that feedback. So that's what we're up to. What else do I need to talk about that I haven't? I guess one thing that you'll see on that question is those are very open-ended questions very unique to the person we're talking to and there's no messages so it's not like we're coming in with our messages we'll listen to you for a while and then here's what you need to know we don't have that so if you're looking for that don't hold your breath that won't be there now if you want to an ask a question we'll do our best to answer any question that you have but this is not about us having a message we're going to give to you we don't have one it's about going and engaging you and talking to you about these things and anything that's on your heart so just expect that to be the way it goes. Uh, the other thing that some folks asked in some earlier sessions that we had today was what's the outcome? So that's gonna be in a couple of ways. One is uh, we are going to produce the results, right? Because we're gonna have some results and we're gonna tell everybody what it is, we're gonna proclaim it verbally, it'll be written up, it'll be on the website, all that. But it's going to be, um, part of the, the rudder, I guess, is kind of a way I picture it to influence our direction in the future, right? It's not, we're not gonna congratulate ourselves and say, most awesome vision statement ever, you know, because that's, that's not the outcome. The outcome is out of the book of James, where he says, get off the dime, stop talking about it, and go do something that matters to somebody. And that's the end result. You know, the master came back and the three servants had to give an account. You know, what have you done for me lately? Really, was the accountability question from that master. And so we want to be about some things that, that really honor some of the principles actually from millennials that say, are you doing something that's true and genuine and matters? And when I think about the millennials, the people that say, you know, your traditions, there, there may be no truth or the traditions don't matter. If we can be about something that's genuine and has meaning for someone, those millennials are gonna grow and mature serving you know, shoulder to shoulder with us and realize there is a truth that inspires all this. And we're gonna be instrumental in helping those people with that kind of mindset appreciate a truth that they don't appreciate today. Okay. What else, uh, Kevin, have we not talked about? Yeah, any questions from anybody? You're gonna have some things that you say, here's something we need to fix today to, to do what we're doing today better. That's important, that we wanna hear that, so share that. But also that's a little different topic than what do we need to become in 10 years, if you follow me. Those aren't necessarily the same thing. So whereas how we 
greet visitors today in the building, if you've got an idea about that, we want to hear about that. That's not the same answer as how do you envision, or it may not be the same answer, how do you envision West Houston looking like in 10 years? Those could be different questions with different answers. So it, sometimes it's hard for all of us to kind of get our head around, and I'm a fix-it kind of guy. I'm a left brain fix-it kind of guy. I like things lined up, as you can see. I like them you know, drawn some certain ways. And if my wife tells me anything at any point that's not perfect, I immediately try to figure out how to fix it. That's just what I do, all right? And she usually says, Scott, stop trying to fix it. I'm just telling you something. So that leads me to this. If you want to fix something, we want to do that. But it's a little different than saying, here's what we need to become in 10 years. And that's what we're trying to, that's what we're going to write the short story about. We're always looking for fix it. But, uh, but that's a different question, yeah. Page, it's a good question. That's not intended to group our people, okay. and I may have misled you into to thinking that was the case. That there are trends that happen. There's a lot of what we know is true today has been true for 30 years, and we've not captured any of that. So we've got a core of modern thinking folks that are kind of my age that have been around for a long time, and they think certain ways, and they've contributed a lot of great things to the church, and a lot of what we see is there because of them. We haven't captured any of that in this. This is the trends that are different that make us realize we're going to be in a different world in 10 years than we've been getting to today. Does that make sense? And so we have a whole host of people on whose shoulders we've stood to get where we are. That's a fact. We didn't, we didn't intend it with this list to capture those people and their circumstances. What the question was, was what trends are a lot different than what we've experienced over the last 30 years that we need to be alive to? So, so I think the question that we asked was a little different than the one you just answered. And so it's not our intent for you to find where do you fit in there. You know, we're not saying if you're non-Anglo, then you fit in that non-Anglo group. We're saying there's a trend that says we are clearly a non-Anglo community. We need to know that. We've kind of been just kind of ignoring that for a long time. Now let's talk about that because that came up in a previous question too. When Jesus, right before he was seized, all right, right before Judas comes bouncing down the path and you hear his footsteps coming up, He's in prayer, and he prays for several things. He First, he prays for himself a bit, and then he prays for his disciples, the ones that are right with him. And then the third thing he does, he prays for you and me and all who would become believers after time. And what he asks for in that prayer is for unity. That's the last thing he prays for. When he's really, really bearing down on prayer, that's what he does. And so we know that unity is important. And we know that he desires it. Right? So... Uh, I think that gets to where you are. We want to we be unified for sure. Uh, let me make a couple points up. When we think about what is the gospel, the gospel is not having unity. That's not the gospel. And the gospel is not hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized. That's not the gospel. That's a, a gr appropriate response to the gospel. It's a great response to the gospel. It's the response we wish everybody would have, but it's not the gospel. The gospel is God became flesh, came and walked among us, died on our behalf, was raised. If he's not raised, all the rest of it didn't matter. And that we are saved through our faith, putting our faith in him. That's the gospel, and the rest of it is response and so forth. And so, and neither is unity. But we want unity because God wants unity. Jesus wants unity. We want to do that. When we walk back through our history, when we built this building, there was a lot of people that came together and said, let's do that. That was great. There were some people that said, no. I'm going. They're gone. You probably know some. They just said, I don't believe in it. I don't, I don't think we need to do this for good reasons, some of them. And they, and, they, and they haven't been back. Now, should we have not done this because they didn't? No, but, there's, but you can't just say we're just doing this because we just want to do this. You have to be aware. Where's our body? What's expedient for them? What's going to make it right? But what we don't want to do, though, Paige, is this, and I'm guilty of this. I sometimes get in a mode that says, if I can just find a way to make this church more comfortable and convenient for us who show up every week, then, then we'll be doing good. And none of us wants that without the mission. And what will happen is they'll make things convenient enough. Things will be comfortable enough because it's not about our comfort. It's about the mission, and we want people who are engaged in saying, I've got something to do other than making sure the worship sermon is just the way I want it or there's pictures on the front of the wall, or there's not pictures on the front of the wall, and so forth. I'm about serving others. I'm about teaching Jesus. And the rest of that is, 
I don't really, I, this is a great place to worship because I love these people and we are sojourners and we're doing that. That's where we want to get. But you raise a great point on two things. There is a large group of people here and we have no intention of just saying disregard what they say. This whole process is because of that. Start talking and listen to the people that are, that are kind of key bits of this family and go from there. Great, thank you for sharing that, little Page. And you'll have a lot more time as, when we get together with you. Agreed. And you know, um, a, a response that, that we can hear is, y'all need to do this, that, or the other, right? This isn't a y'all story. This is an us story. And uh, so it's one, one of the key things that we want to learn from you is ways you see yourself being involved, engaged, giving, sacrificing, right? It's not all about taking. There's very little about taking, actually. And so the more we can be on the giving end, actually it's kind of, I guess, counterintuitive, but your unity factor goes up the more we try to give as opposed to take, right. you know. So that's, that's hard in our culture because we're in this consumer society and uh, whatever you've got now you need to have an appetite for more taking more buying more getting more using more and our Christian call is the opposite of that 